So, welcome to this talk. The title of this talk is Applications Instead of Libraries. And that's just the name of the internal document that I, I use when this whole affair started. But it's actually more like about micro frontends. I'm going to be talking about that. And my name is Mario. I'm a software engineer. And I live in Germany, although I think my accent betrays that I'm actually from Spain. There are three themes that I want to cover in this uh, talk. First is distributing front-end applications, right? Like, how do you go about distributing front-end applications is one, one challenge that we face, and that led us to using micro front-ends. Then it's adopting module federation, which happens to be the technology that we use to implement that, and I want to talk a bit about what's that and how does it work. And lastly, I want to talk about what we had to do to make that production ready. I mean, any technology, right? You can sort of wipe up an MVP, uh, but having it in, in production is a slightly different thing, right? And so let's start with distributing front-end applications. So just to give you a bit of context, this is something that I did while at uh, Wafer. I used to work there no longer. And in case you don't know, I don't think they are in Switzerland. It's an online uh, retailer. They sell furniture online. It's an American company. Pretty common, uh, popular in the US, a bit in the UK and in Germany. And Partner Home is this. It's like, you know, like it has two sides. It has the B2C side where, where consumers like sort of buy stuff. And it also has another side, which is what we call Partner Home, which is like the supplier portal, if you will, like the place where suppliers upload their wares, track inventory, um, see how their stuff is doing. All that is less visible than the store, right? It's a bit, uh, I mean, fewer users, of course, but it's still really important for the health of the business. And it's not a small thing. Uh, just, you know, some rough numbers. A flow in, in the internal uh, lingo was something like in between a feature and a page. So kind of a hundred different separate flows you could count with. And there were like about 30 application teams working on that at the same time. So it was definitely something a bit, uh, you know, like significant. And this application started, as it often does, in a PHP monolith, as many others. And things started changing. This is, I mean, a long-running thing for sure. And over the past few years, it has been transitioning to more like a decoupled architecture where uh, services are divided in individual services so that teams have like a bit more ownership over their own services. And in terms of technology, I mean, of course, this is a gross simplification because any big company has a ton of tech involved. But in terms of what we were using to build layouts, it was mostly based around React, which was fairly important because any solution that we might think of uh, could assume that everybody was going to be using React, which made things a lot simpler. And so that's a bit of context, to, you know, so that that's, that's the ecosystem I was working with. And I want to talk a bit about the challenges that we had that led us to consider something like uh, this. And I mean, you could say there are more than one challenge, but in summary, it's like distributing shared concerns. And by that, I mean, you know, coming back to this uh, partner home main page, the navigation on the left hand side, right? It's, I mean, let's assume that's something that appears on almost every page. And actually, it's quite important because uh, our partner home is not the most navigable application. It's a bit of historical reasons there, but users really rely on, on the navigation to sort of being able to transition between different areas. If it's not there, it's a bit of a problem. And it's not, I mean, it seems like, I mean, it's not a list of links. That's, it's, it's a bit more than that. We will talk a bit about that over the course of the talk. But it's something slightly more complicated. And the thing is that in a monolith, it's kind of easy. But when you are sort of building this application as a collection of individual uh, smaller applications, they all need to make sure that they are rendering these kind of things. Can be in navigation. There are other things that we could be trying to include. And so our first attempt at fixing this was 
through a dedicated NPM package. Kind of simple, right? Like, I mean, every decouple app sort of builds its bundle, and one part of it is this navigation that is packaged as an internal uh, package that we distribute. And me being here giving a talk probably indicates that this didn't quite work that well for us. And so, yeah, there, are, there were some challenges that we face. First and foremost, propagating updates in something like, I mean, essentially, right, if you have like, I don't know, not, I mean, I mentioned like a lot of flows, a lot of teams, not everybody was like sort of having their own application that rendered its own URL, but it was definitely like a fair amount of them. And if you are iterating fast, you need them to, I mean, if you're distributing your stuff as a package and they own their own application, they need to carry the updates. There's no way around it. And Wafer, for a bunch of historical reasons, is not the best at, at, at this mode. Like Some of the teams really struggle with updating things. I mean, not just our stuff, but updating things in general was a bit of a problem. And so they were always lagging behind. And we were iterating a lot. Like That navigation went through a lot of uh, changes, both layout-wise, but also in how it worked, how the data it consumed uh, was fetched, because it actually had to. And so it led to a lot of consistency issues, where this thing would not really render the same way on every page, which makes things really confusing for users, because maybe there are items there that are not behaving the same way, and then they haven't. I mean, essentially, it makes a, this part, this navigating between uh, different sites, hard. And lastly, the operability part of it. I mean, as I mentioned, this was a front-end app that actually consumed data. I mean, it had to fetch permissions mostly, but they had to fetch things from a bunch of different underlying systems. So it had to have a backend component. And having a ton of versions at the same time, working in parallel, introduces a, well, a lot of yeah, different, I mean, you know, like you have to keep things compatible. Things might break in some scenarios and then like, you have to think how you're going to test it, what's actually monitoring the app. Like, operating it is not the easiest thing. And so we come to the second part, which is applications instead of libraries. It's a mm, catch name I came up with. And the idea behind calling it like this is getting away, a bit away from the technolo yeah, technological aspect. Not just like, all right, we're going to re-implement it and use this tech, this system, but more like what is what we're going to accomplish. And in this case, what we want to accomplish is to treat the navigation, but other entities in the page as well, as their own applications, with their own lifecycle, with their own like clear ownership of who is supposed to uh, develop and operate it, and with all the consequences, who is supposed to come in quickly when something doesn't work. This is exactly what I mean by it. You treating is a live application. And so that kind of fits well with the concept of micro frontends. Uh, don't really have enough time to go very deep into micro frontends. I'm kind of assuming that you at least have heard of it, I hope. But anyways, like just you know, as a brief introduction, you can say this, but you can also say, I mean, I think the easy way of describing micro frontends is microservices, but for a frontend. Like you kind of, you know, like, Microservices, I mean, what else can be said at this point about that? But essentially applying the same ideas to, uh, to this side, to, do, to the part that where you're building the layout. And it has two, two aspects. One is like what we as developers see, which is essentially that each of these applications actually it's its own separate application, which is own built uh, cycle, and it gets some artifact. Usually, in the case of a front-end app, an SPA would be some sort of bundle with JavaScript, HTML, and some CSS. And then, at some point, you have to orchestrate this. You have to combine it. Because even if we are splitting this in separate applications, the application is still one unit. And the user, I mean, I don't know if they would like to have to like, check five different pages just to get the experience in your site. Probably not. So there is some, some layer of integration. And from the perspective of the user, it kind of should look the same. It's just that different side parts of it are rendered by uh, things that are actually separate applications. 
and we try our best to make that as transparent as possible, but there are always some trade-offs here. We'll come to this a bit. And so, yeah, that's the 30 to 45 seconds explanation what the microphone then is. And when we started, I already mentioned with the challenges, so I kind of, this is sort of the opposite. We really wanted to have a quicker path to production. We really wanted to say when we are ready, when we are confident that a certain version is ready to go, we wanted to propagate ASAP to our users. And still, we want to preserve the autonomy. I mean, as I saw, showed in that slide a bit, we had this monolith, and then with a monolith, certain things are really clear, right? Like everything goes in one package, but other things are really unclear, especially if you have older parts that are no longer really very well owned or maintained. Ownership is a huge issue. It's one that we face quite a bit, so it was absolutely uh, fundamental for us not to sacrifice or not to blurry the lines, uh, the lines of ownership when doing this. If you want to implement microfrontends, there are a ton of ways. You can do, I don't know, build time, server-side integration, runtime composition. Definitely something that won't fit in this talk. I left a link there in case you are curious. And I want to focus a bit more on the actual implementation that we picked for this situation. Which brings me to module federation. So, you know, like, as the context, this supplier portal, we have, didn't mention, but it had decent to significant amount of traffic. Like this navigation bar was getting, I don't know, like the backends got like a few million hits a day, more or less, all things considered. And so we actually, at this point, we were like, it was more a bet. We, our bet was that we could, through the use of uh, micro frontends, in this case, through the use of my, uh, module federation, would actually solve this, pro this challenge that I mentioned. So what is actually module federation? The new feature in Webpack 5 uh, has been, I think, has been production ready for like early last year, more or less, give or take. And in essence, it's not really like too complex. It's, it's just a system of loading uh, modules remotely at runtime. So if, I don't know, if you use like a relatively modern version of React, maybe you're using already re uh, dynamic imports where you load part of the application remotely and asynchronously. It's sort of similar, but it doesn't come from the same bundle. You can actually get chunks that come from somewhere else. So that's the kind of the boundary for the applications. And so what is this, why is this relevant, you might ask. And the thing is that it allows to create integration between applications with has relatively low friction. And like friction is one thing that can, I mean, I'll try to get to this in the learnings, but the friction of like teams having to adopt things is what actually tends to kill the project, not whether that technology works or not, in my experience. So thus far, I kept kind of high level. And so I want to dive a bit deeper. I'm going to talk a bit more how this actually works. I'm going to show a bit of code, a bit simplified so that it actually fits in, in slides. And I'll try to give you an idea of how this uh, looks in practice. So. We have two concepts here. I mean, uh, we usually have like, you know, like we have these decoupled applications and then there is like a remote application. That's a self, I mean, individual independent application that we want to consume from, from what we call a host application, one that gets its own URL. As an example, this navigation bar would be a really good one. And so we want to make this thing, I mean, we are deploying this right already, like we're putting it somewhere, a CDN, whatever, and we want to make it accessible. So that's the first part where Webpack comes in. And using, I mean, model federation is mostly like a Webpack thing, which has a positive side and a negative side. The negative side is as a Webpack thing. I mean, personally, I, I don't know, like I feel like I feel doing things in Webpack really hard. Maybe I don't know why, but I've always tried to avoid that. Uh, but you cannot get out of this if you want to use maceration. But it has a positive aspect to it, which is that it's actually more or less contained to the, to the Webpack side. Like in terms of how you build an app, how you structure an application, I mean, we were, if you're thinking React, it doesn't really change. Like you are not going to build applications in a different way for the most part. 
So that's good because it doesn't really force you to adopt like I don't know, a new structure, do things differently, do all different kind of components. All that kind of stays the same. And so, I mean, in terms of exposing an app as a remote module, you have to give it a name. And you sort of say, say, these are the things that we're going to expose. And you can expose anything. Like model federation is totally React agnostic. And you could actually use this to expose, like, I don't know, like functions, like things that are like very low level. And in this case, React tends to work with components. So our quantum of sharing is a React component. And we're starting with a small one, like could be like a simple thing, but we will build on top of this. And then there is like this block below, which is about dependencies, and I'm going to get to that. It's just like to try to make a half realistic example. And this enough to expose an application remotely, but of course there's a lot more behind this. The second part is, I mean, we have the remote, so now our application is available in some way, and now we want to use it. So it sort of looks like this. You know, like let's say there is like some of the main flows, like an order or an inventory kind of page. We're kind of rendering those as a separate application. It has its own URL, so it's sort of an independent thing. And we want to make use of one of these remote applications, right? Either as kind of a widget where you insert it and, and, and forget about it, or where there is some sort of interaction between the two. Doesn't really matter. So the answer to that is more uh, model federation stuff. And it looks fairly close, but it's fairly similar. It's a bit different, though. The key part is this here. Like, you sort of declare the remotes. You declare where this thing comes from. I exposed the other one as remote. The name was remote. And now I'm using that. And I'm telling this configuration where to find it. It is localhost, but it could be an actual real URL. And so this makes for the host application. This makes this remote available. And it, again, it has dependencies, which will come after this. And in order to use it, in something like React, you can actually, I mean, I mentioned already dynamic imports. Pretty much the same, but you are sort of uh, using a, a prefix there. And so we actually end up building this lazy model, like an abstraction to load like components uh, remotely, which is using, I mean, the suspense API, because this is an asynchronous operation. So you have to, I mean, it's definitely not like, uh, it's a bit different because things come asynchronously, so you have to think about that a bit. But essentially, React supports this kind of stuff pretty well. So you see it there. And we are already like, I mean, this, these two files are already enough to do this sharing between one and the other. But there are a few problems and a few challenges that make this not as simple. And the first one I'm coming to is dynamic loading. And uh, maybe you have already checked this, and, and something feels wrong about this line. And I guess, like, you know, the, f the problem is, I mean, we are assuming that everybody here is doing some, some, some form of continuous integration. So then it's like, that's a hard-coded URL. So if the remote only comes from a hard-coded URL, how do you do, like, staging and uh, staging environment? How do you do, I mean, this is localhost, but how do you test it locally? Like, if everything points to prod, you are just going to release your stuff and hope for the best, which is not the best technique in order to make sure that things work. So this, this doesn't fly. We need something more flexible. And it turns out that when we were uh, working on this, there wasn't really a good way of doing this. And I think, I'm not sure if has changed, but it forced us to extend the abstraction, right? Like we had this lazy module, and we had to build a remote component on top. And this is just, again, another abstraction. And the key part here is the uh, load remote, which is, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not showing the code for that for two reasons. One is because it's actually fairly big. And second, because it looks so hacky that it's a bit embarrassing. So I'm keeping it under the hood. But essentially, you kind of have to rip, I mean, simulate that you are going to load assets through Webpack. And in a way that you can inject like some sort of uh, URL, usual. I mean, we use environment variables so that we could build different bundles throughout our, our pipeline so that we could actually use the, them. And it is extremely simplified. It took a colleague of mine like three weeks to get the whole thing working. And I'm going to share a link in the end if you, in case you want to check that. It's definitely a lot more code that I can fit in slides, a couple 
I don't know, 200, 300 lines of JavaScript. But essentially, let's assume we have a way of saying, well, I'm going to load this, and this loader is going to be smart enough to either pick the, the right environment or to allow overrides so that we can actually like test this locally and not have to wait for an expensive CI run. Now I get to the second big issue that we have here, which is shared dependencies. Shared dependencies is one of the classical issues with uh, micro frontends. In the end, right, like, I mean, this microservices stuff and so on, it all like sounds perfect, but at the end of the day, you have to serve one page to your users. And then you, at some point, you have to pick what you do with your dependencies. Let's say we use React, and then we have like three, four uh, uh, micro frontends in our page. Do we ship different versions of React for each, which means that the user downloads four times uh, React? Or do we use one, which means that we are creating a point of coupling that actually means that this autonomy that I keep talking about is not so autonomous in practice. Or even like, do we allow a free for all and, and people can use Angular, Vue.js, or whatever they want? This actually, I mean, it's not, it's not a problem that's unique to Models Federation. I think every approach that uh, does, I mean, every, every micro front end approach has to handle this some way or the other. And so, yeah, I mean, if you think of the user experience, you cannot really, or you should not force users to uh, download React multiple times. But you don't also want to sacrifice all this independence that we are fighting so hard for by having like a, you know, like something that every, I mean, some sort of thing that everybody needs to uh, agree with. And there is not really, I mean, the sad part is there's not really like a satisfying answer to this. It's more like what is, you know, like what is the balance in the trade offs that you are, uh, that works in a scenario and you're willing to accept. And Model Federation allows you to play a bit with this to define this in, in like to define the dependencies that are shared. If you don't do anything, it will be loaded as first come, first serve, which is okay for 90% of dependencies or even more. But at some point, you have to pick, like, I don't know, like React is a classic and, and maybe internal libraries that have some shared state. So you can pick, you can sort of decide what is the version that we want to enforce. Do we want to make it uh, a singleton? And this, it sort of depends. I mean, I think, I mean, if you're using context APIs, you need only one version of React on the page, I think. And this can get a bit tricky, like, I mean, especially with upgrades, of course, right? We actually faced this issue. Uh, we had to upgrade to, from React 16 to 17. And then we had to do something. And then it's like, do you force everybody to upgrade at the same time? Do you allow some flexibility? And luckily, React 17 is backwards compatible with 16, so you can actually you could actually relax the restriction and allow people to sort of opt in and ex and take the performance hit for a bit. Uh, but for instance, like something like React 18 actually is not backwards compatible, and then it gets dicier. But I actually wasn't part of this project anymore uh, before that happened, so I kind of managed to skip this one. And honestly, I mean, if somebody has a good idea about this, I would all ears, all ears, because it's. I've done micro frontends a few times and never really found a really good solution. So anyhow, we have a comp house application and we have a remote application. It's already enough to get started, but there are still things that we need to talk about. In the first uh, webpack stuff that I showed, I was talking about single components, but a micro front, I mean, the whole point of doing micro front is to kind of have like more self-contained apps and go past that. You can expose single components if you wish. It works, but that's definitely not what we were aiming for. And so state is, the, like I think, one of the key parts, right? How do you like, handle state? One requirement that we had is the remote comp remotes have to have a way of hiding state. We don't want to expose their internal state so that it can be modified, because then changes to that are hard to trace back, and you are, again, back to the monolith. So that's not what we wanted. The context API actually works really well in this case. So we actually build a lot on that. Like all remote applications sort of build a small context. And actually, when we are going to expose a component, we wrap the whole thing in a context that remains private. The host application doesn't have access to this uh, provider, so they won't be ever able to change anything. So you keep this encapsulation. And the, I mean, I could go into a long, uh, yeah, long, 
discussion where like you know like what and what about Redux? Like we have had some. I have well, not in this project, but we had some experiences with trying to use Redux as a shared store. And yeah, global storage is always dangerous. So we were trying to reduce the the surface uh, area as much as possible. But this is not always like, I mean, it would be ideal if we could do this, but in the end you are kind of building one unified, coherent experience, and things interact with each other to some extent. Otherwise it would be a collection of different apps, and then it's like, do you actually need to, to render all those in the same page? So you have to share some things. And we actually end up using the context API again. And one example, heavily simplified, but something like a locale. If you're rendering, I mean, if you are building a localized application, the host application might, you know, like have like, all right, we are using German. And then your remote also needs to be aware of that. Otherwise, you might be rendering one part of the app in German, the other one in English, which is bad experience. So we pass that through a shared provider, we call it. And then in order to make this work, you kind of have to have the provider on both sides. So we have this blue box there which is a shared provider. Uh, I don't remember right now, the something like that. It's basically a library. Iron ironically, that's something we had to distribute as a library because we tried to do go all the way uh, to uh, and export it as a favorite model itself, and it gets a bit dicey. So it's a shared library that is, I would call it like the API between different uh, remote applications. It has a common interface. It's as restricted as possible that you use. And so it has like this provider so that we can sort of pass data back and forth. And it has some cross-cutting concerns. This is not a comprehensive list, but things like logging, like maybe you want to have consistent logging. Monitoring, if you are using something like Datadog, you, cannot actually, you need to initialize it once per page, otherwise the, signal, the collection doesn't really work. I already talked about locale, but locale is only a small part of internationalization. So other things also, you know, translations, many things need to be there. I went up building this thing that actually our team owned, and it was like the only interaction point uh, that we allowed between these applications. This is, I mean, or unless you would want to go through a backend, which is also fun, viable. And so that's more or less the part related to uh, model federation itself. So in the end, again, like there is a bit of a hidden uh, JavaScript slash Webpack magic, but in the end, it's like exposing something, making the other one aware, using them, and creating like, some sort of common interface. And that was enough for us. Like I'm talking, I don't know, like three, four months from when we started the project to have this navigation available. But having it available, like we were able to put this, and and it was could be consumed, that doesn't mean that it's production ready. And I like I always like that this tweet from the Borat a lot. And it comes to, you know, like I've been talking about this application instead of libraries about like reaching production fast as if it's a positive thing. But it doesn't necessarily have to, right? I mean, with libraries, if you introduce a bug, propagation is maybe a bit slower, so it's a bit more control. Whereas if you are actually, I mean, if you go here, like if you follow this model and you deploy something and that something happens to be broken, you are breaking it for everybody at once. So it's really important to, to shift the mindset that it's not just a library anymore, it's like a live application that has like, you know, like that there are guarantees that we want to offer that this is going to work. And so there are a bunch of aspects to talk about. One is error handling, and in this case, or lazy module again, like, you know, like our abstraction, keeps growing and growing. One part of it is uh, like what I have in the component did catch, sort of monitoring a bit what's happening, getting a bit more data when, when things are not working right. So we can isolate failures and track them properly and know like, you know, who is the right uh, team or person that can ha handle them. Things like error boundaries where you sort of make sure that a small, I mean, if a page is, com is importing a few remote applications, it's probably not okay if the whole thing blows up, if there is an error on one. Like you can probably still serve something, so you kind of have to wrap it in some sort of error boundary and display meaningful fallbacks and make sure that the experience is not compromised. 
otherwise it's really hard to build like a you know like an ecosystem of different apps especially when your own app might go down because somebody else did something we don't want that and testing i mean we are i mean the assumption is that we are already testing all stuff thoroughly so what what is the difference in this approach actually not a lot i mean I don't know if you, uh, this is the testing trophy from Kenzie Dots. And so that's the one I've been following for the past few years. And honestly, it's pretty much the same. You have like, you know, as many statics checks as you can, a layer of unit tests, then like integ integrating different React components and maybe like some end-to-end -end tests at the top to verify core flows. And the only difference is that you need to test like when you are exposing your app as a remote, you need to test that that thing kind of works. And then it's a bit tricky, right? Because if you want to involve multiple apps, then you are kind of adding, again, coupling and for tests and reliable pipelines. That's already sounding like something that a bit fishy. So what we ended up doing was, as part of all the shared tooling that we built, every remote application expo uh, it can import itself. It's a bit meta, but it, it sort of works where you kind of export yourself in a way that you can test an application in isolation so that you don't really need to build like complex pipelines that depend on each other. And we covered that with a few tests based on Cypress. Uh, you cannot really test uh, model federation with something like JSTOM because it actually, I mean, it's on a higher level. It doesn't really work. I'm not sure if it will ever work. So we had to cover some of this, elevate it a bit with, uh, with, with more like closer to end-to-end -end or functional tests with Cypress in our case. That doesn't mean that you're not going to, I mean, all the unit tests that you're building, all those things are still there. This is just like a layer on top to make it a bit more uh, re resilient. And then you can even talk, think about contract testing. I'm not sure if you are familiar, I mean, contract, te contract testing on the back end, something I really like to do. And you can think of going in that direction. We did not, but I have a colleague that has worked a bit on that. So I think it's a fun fun uh, direction to explore, especially if this micro front and start communicating with each other more over time. Like if you sort of build some sort of event bus there, I think it, it kind of makes sense. And so I have error handling, right? Preventing errors, testing, making, you know, making, uh, verifying that the behavior is sort of expected, but we still need to monitor stuff. And I have it in red letters because I think that's, maybe the main takeaway, right? Which is once you deploy uh, this as a micro front end, an app as a micro front end, it's a live application. It's no longer a library. I mean, depending on, on where, where you are, there are expectations that that thing is going to be up. So you need to make sure that that's actually the case. And I mean, monitoring is another topic that you can definitely talk at length. But one thing that really works well are synthetic tests. I'm not sure if the screenshot is really showing that very well. This is in Datadog, but a synthetic test is essentially like an end-to-end -end test that runs continuously. Like on prod, you can run this, like you can sort of navigate, like again, like some core flow that has absolutely, uh, like it's critical to you. It's cannot, you cannot afford for it not to work. And then if this thing starts failing, fails too much, fails from two different locations, you trigger some alert. And then the, the alert can go, well, to any paging system like PagerDuty or similar. And then you can notify that your thing uh, is actually not working. And so I, this PagerDuty is like, OK, I, mm, I don't know. Like, I mean, for me, it's, I always, I mean, I've been doing, I've been in on-call rotations for a long time. So it's something natural, but it also sounds like a bit scary. It's like I started this talk like building some nice React components and end up on, on, on call. Maybe it's not the thing I expected. But honestly, if you really want to treat the software there as a live application and you have expectations that it's going to have a certain reliability, I don't know if it's possible to avoid. So that's things to make it, things to keep in mind to, to make it production ready. Scaling the usage. I talk about all these components, right? Like, I mean, for us, like we were one team that was fairly familiar with all this, but we wanted to make this available for other teams that might be more focused on, on their concrete business domains. So exposing all this as shared functionality that we could maintain uh, was one of the, the actions, so to say, while still 
giving them the ownership of their own applications. Sort of, you know, like kind of a platform tooling, if you will. And another fun aspect is, I mean, if you are successful and people start adopting this, they need to find the remote application. So we end up building yet another abstraction, which is a bit of a registry, right? Like if you have like five, I mean, if you have one or two, you just put the URL somewhere. If you start having a bit more, a few more, you start building a sort of a, you know, like service discovery, some sort of console thing in the front end. And we kind of abstracted that, and it can start very simple. Like, I mean, only at that point, at the point where, where we're here, it was just a hash with a list of names, but exposed in a way that people need to be fully aware of that, and releasing a new one was a bit simpler. And the very last part is like encouraging adoption or discouraging it. A question I got a lot was, should we actually build our new application as a micro front end from, from application teams in our org? And yeah, I gave the consultant answer, which is it depends. Just because you have tech available to you doesn't mean that you have to use it. It's really, I mean, in the end, not everything needs to be a micro front end. Like, not everything moves that very fast. Not everybody needs the, the added, you know, like the added complexity. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's something to keep in mind and doing a case by case base. And also, I think the boundaries are really important. I mean, you know, like, I mean, it's actually, I mean, you have experience building some sort of complex microservice architecture. You probably know what I mean. Uh, if the boundaries are not set correctly, microservices are actually worse than, I mean, than not doing anything. So finding, finding meaningful boundaries is hard, and yet it's totally crucial to have success when you're trying to split things in domains. And it's something that is so domain dependent that I don't think there is any, any general advice other than without understanding the domain you're moving, uh, that you are working with, it's really hard to ma meaningfully break this down. I would, I mean, I think that's why so many things start as, as monoliths, right? Because in the beginning, you don't really know. And as you understand the domain better, you can sort of extract it. And I think that's more likely to lead to an architecture that makes sense than trying to do it from the beginning. So lessons learned from this are, I'll start with uh, positives. Using model federation is just, I mean, I, it's just one flavor of uh, micro front ends. It works particularly well in a case like ours. Like if you only have one, one stack, you can really make it easier on yourself. Like, I mean, I don't know, did I mention, I mean, typically like something like single SPA really helps when you want to, for some reason, you need like a page that is in Angular and another one is in React. It can make sense. I mean, it's always going to be a compromise in terms of the user experience, but maybe it allows you to move faster, which in the end brings more value. So in our case, Model Federation worked well. Quick path to production. Like actually, we actually were able to iterate quite fast. Like you know, like with automated pipelines, you could really release new versions pretty fast. And the isolation is pretty nice. I mean, as I said, the points where where this sort of abstraction is a bit more visible is at the edges. Like when you are touching, communicating between uh, different applications, or when you are touching uh, webpack code. And that's something that is fairly plausible to isolate, like put it in, in shared uh, libraries in, in things that not everybody needs to understand. Not everybody needs to become an expert on this. Like we were, I mean, I was part of a team that was more, had more of a platform focus. So it was okay for us to invest the time, but it was kind of hard to justify for applications teams to under, really understand these things in depth. So we wanted to provide abstractions that would allow them, enable them to, to move faster without having to take all the burden. I think it works, but I mean, don't take this as a, this is, there are no challenges. I hope that that was clear over the course of the presentation that it's definitely not like a fix for everything. And I mean, every talk about micro fronts need to include Dan Abramov's tweet. And honestly, micro fronts don't make sense in every situation. And I think it's always going to compromise a bit. Like you always are going to introduce some compromises, like no matter how hard you try, this is not just going to be like as mm, maybe like elegant or simple as a simple application that you build once. So that's pretty much it. I think I did perfect time. And here are a few links, uh, some GitHub repo with the parts that I could share. I mean, some of this stuff was proprietary, so 
I kind of uh, build like a simple example with all this, like you know, like all the Webpack uh, magic and stuff. And I think it gives kind of a good uh, idea of how things work. And I have a few articles there, like that will go in a bit more detail in case you're curious. So that's it from my side, uh, and I think we will have some time for questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some time for questions before we break for lunch. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes. Sorry. I'm live. <laughs> uh, hi. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So, um, uh, uh, how did you, did you encounter, let's say, a breaking changes, the managing breaking changes between components when they're in a run runtime? And the second question, how did your local setup look like when you work with a, a highly distributed application? So in terms of breaking changes, I mean, one is like if your components are calling APIs and then they are not longer compatible, that's one, right? But for us, we try to keep the ownership of front end and back end together so that the same thing kind of evolves that. And the fact that it's like a live app means that it's a bit easier to coordinate than when you have multiple versions. Another breaking change is if your component has a certain list of props and then the, uh, the like whoever is using it is trying to pass props that no longer exist, for instance. I think there you have to kind of build them. I mean, you have to keep backwards compatibility in mind when you are building those because you don't really know who is using Like, you cannot really ensure that it's going to go from 0 to 100 instantly. You can do it fast, but not that fast. And another breaking change are the dependencies, which I already mentioned a bit, like relaxing the dependencies, making things backwards compatible. But at some point, like for really hairy ones, like a very major version of React, I think you have to synchronize people a bit. Like I didn't find a better method than that, which is a bit of a bummer, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's a better way. And as for the second question, in terms of local setup, I mean, as I mentioned, right, like this thing that's rendering itself, like one part was at least the remote application should be able to run on its own, right, on local host so that you could test most of the stuff on your own. And then in terms of orchestration, like we kind of build it in a way that you could sort of, uh, I mean, we have a test system, so that would be one point of, of testing, but we could sort of say, uh, if you are using like a main page and then we're including this navigation, we configure it in a way through all these shared libraries that you could specify a local, like it would default to the right environment or to a test environment, but you could override that. So you could say, I'm testing my new version of this page and I really want to have like the version that I'm working on so that I get this change. So basically through, through like a change in the tooling, I mean through like overriding configurations and, and variables and stuff, you could actually force that to be like local so that you could, I mean, one of the goals was we wanted to have a local development available. Like we didn't want to wait for an expensive pipeline to run to, to iterate because that would make it really hard. I'm sure it answers your question. Hi, uh, my question is very similar actually. I was wondering um, if you had any trouble with browser caches uh, using all these modules? Uh, I mean, you can, like, model federation is fairly smart about that. Like, when you are including a module, I mean, in the end, you have to think that the thing that you are importing is just a URL. It's like a URL that is like URL slash remote uh, file.js. And that thing is a JavaScript file. So you can control the cache at that level. So if it's an a CDN, you can invalid, you can bust the cache. Or like, you know, like it's sort of similar to what we, you would do. So we didn't need to do a lot of like very comprehensive caching. And we had other bigger problems to fish. And so essentially, the answer is that you kind of use the same tools that you have for other things. And again, if you need to rely on different versions working, you still have to keep backwards compatibility in mind. And if you want to break a change, then you have to maybe orchestrate that and force the loading of the new model or, or wait for people to release, maybe do a two-phase release. 